Section 10. Letters 46 to 50. Letter the 46th. The Chevalier d'Anceny to Cécile Volange. What has happened to you then, my adored Cécile? What can have caused in you so sudden and cruel an alteration? What has become of your vows of never changing? It was only yesterday that you repeated them with so much pleasure. Who can have made you forget them to-day? It is useless for me to examine myself. I cannot find the cause of it in me, and it is terrible that I should have to seek it in you. Ah, doubtless you are neither light nor deceitful, and even in this moment of despair no insulting suspicion shall defile my soul. Yet by what fatality comes it that you are no longer the same? No, cruel one, you are no longer the same. The tender Cecile, the Cecile whom I adore, and whose vows I have received, would not have avoided my gaze, would not have resisted the happy chance which placed me beside her, or, if any reason which I cannot understand had forced her to treat me with such severity, she would, at least, have condescended to inform me of it. Ah, you do not know. You will never know, my Cécile, all that you made me suffer to-day, all that I suffer still at this moment. Do you suppose, then, that I can live if I am no longer loved by you? None the less, when I asked you for a word, one single word to dispel my fears, instead of answering me, you pretended to be afraid of being overheard, and that difficulty which did not then exist— you immediately brought about yourself by the place which you chose in the circle. When, compelled to leave you, I asked you at what hour I could see you again to-morrow, you pretended that you could not say, and Madame de Voulange had to be my informant. Thus the moment ever decides so fondly, which is to bring me into your presence to-morrow, will only excite in me anxiety, and the pleasure of seeing you, hitherto so dear to my heart, will give place to the fear of being intrusive. I feel it already. This dread irks me, and I dare not speak to you, my love. That I love you, which I loved so well to repeat when I could hear it in my turn, that soft phrase which suffice for my felicity, offers me, if you are changed, no more than the image of an eternal despair. I cannot believe, however, that that talisman of love has lost all its power, and I am fain to employ it once more. Note, those who have not had occasion sometimes to feel the value of a word, an expression, consecrated by love, will find no meaning in this sentence. Yes, my Cecile, I love you. Repeat after me, then, this expression of my happiness— Remember that you have accustomed me to the hearing of it, and that to deprive me of it is to condemn me to a torture which, like my love, can only end with my life. Paris, 29th of August, in 17... Letter the 47th. The Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. Ah, to-day again I shall not see you, my lovely friend, and here are my reasons, which I beg you to meet with indulgence. Instead of returning here directly, I stopped with the Comtesse de... whose chateau lay almost upon my road, and of whom I asked a dinner. I did not reach Paris until about seven o'clock, and I alighted at the opera, where I hoped to find you. The opera over, I went to see my fair friends of the green room. I found there my old friend Emilie, surrounded by a numerous court, women as well as men, to whom she was offering a supper that very evening at P i had no sooner entered this assemblage than i was invited to the supper by acclamation i also received one from a little fat and stumpy person who stammered his invitation to me in the french of holland 
and whom i recognised as the true hero of the fete i accepted i learned upon my way that the house whither we were going was the price agreed upon for emily's favours towards this grotesque figure and that this supper was a veritable wedding breakfast the little man could not contain himself for joy in expectation of the pleasure which awaited him he seemed to me so satisfied with the prospect that he gave me a longing to disturb it which was effectually what i did the only difficulty i found was that of persuading emilie who was rendered somewhat scrupulous by the burgomaster's wealth she agreed however after raising some objections to the plan which i suggested of filling this little beer-barrel with wine and so putting him hors de combat for the rest of the night the sublime idea which we had formed of a dutch toper caused us to employ all available means we succeeded so well that at dessert he was already without the strength to lift his glass but the helpful emilie and myself vied with one another in filling him up finally he fell beneath the table in so drunken a state that it ought to last for at least a week we then decided to send him back to paris and as he had not kept his carriage i had him carried into mine and remained in his stead i thereupon received the congratulations of the company which soon afterwards retired and left me in possession of the field this gaiety and perhaps my long rustication made emily seem so desirable to me that i promised to stay with her until the dutchman's resurrection <laughs> this complacence on my part is the price of that which she has just shown me that of serving me for a desk upon which to write to my fair puritan to whom i found it amusing to send a letter written in the bed and almost in the arms of a wench a letter interrupted even to complete an infidelity in which i send her an exact account of my position and my conduct emily who has read the epistle laughed like a mad girl over it and i hope that you will laugh as well as my letter must needs bear the paris postmark i send it to you i leave it open will you please read it seal it up and commit it to the post above all be careful not to employ your own seal nor even any amorous device a simple head adieu my lovely friend p s i open my letter i have persuaded emilie to go to the italien i shall take advantage of that moment to come and see you i shall be with you by six o'clock at the latest and if it be agreeable to you we will go together about seven o'clock to madame de volange propriety commands that i do not postpone the invitation with which i am charged for her from madame de rosemonde moreover i shall be delighted to see the little volange adieu most fair lady i shall be as pleased to embrace you as the chevalier will be jealous at p thirtieth of august seventeen letter the forty eighth the vicomte de valmont to the president de tourvel bearing the postmark of paris it is after a stormy night during which i have not closed my eyes it is after having been ceaselessly either in the agitation of a devouring ardour 
or in an utter annihilation of all the faculties of my soul that i come to seek with you madame the calm of which i have need and which however i have as yet no hope to enjoy in truth the situation in which i am whilst writing to you makes me realize more than ever the irresistible power of love i can hardly preserve sufficient control over myself to put some order into my ideas and i foresee already that i shall not finish this letter without being forced to interrupt it oh what am i never to hope then that you will some day share with me the trouble which overcomes me at this moment i dare believe notwithstanding that if you were well acquainted with it you would not be entirely insensible oh, believe me madame a cold tranquillity the soul's slumber the imitation of death do not conduce to happiness the active passions alone can lead us thither and in spite of the torments which you make me suffer i think i can assure you without risk that at this moment i am happier than you in vain do you overwhelm me with your terrible severities they do not prevent me from abandoning myself utterly to love and forgetting in the delirium which it causes me the despair into which you cast me it is so that i would avenge myself for the exile to which you condemn me never had i so much pleasure in writing to you never have i experienced during such an occupation an emotion so sweet and at the same time so lively everything seems to enhance my transports the air i breathe is laden with pleasure the very table upon which i write to you consecrated for the first time to this office becomes love's sacred altar to me how much will it be beautified in my eyes i shall have traced upon it the vow to love you for ever oh pardon i beseech you the disorder of my senses perhaps i ought to abandon myself less to transports which you do not share i must leave you for a moment to dispel an intoxication which increases each moment and which becomes stronger than myself i return to you madame and doubtless i return always with the same eagerness however the sentiment of happiness has fled far away from me it has given place to that of cruel privation what does it avail me to speak of my sentiments if i seek in vain the means to convince you of them after so many efforts i am equally bereft of strength and confidence if i still tell over to myself the pleasures of love it is only to feel more keenly my sorrow at being deprived of them i see no other resource save in your indulgence and i am too sensible at this moment of how greatly i need it to hope to obtain it never however has my love been more respectful never could it be less likely to offend you it is of such a kind i dare say as the most severe virtue need not fear but i am myself afraid of describing to you at greater length the sorrow which i experience assured as i am that the object which causes it does not participate in it 
i must at any rate not abuse your kindness and it would be to do that were i to spend more time in retracing for you that dolorous picture i take only enough to beg you to reply to me and never to doubt the sincerity of my sentiments written at p dated from paris thirtieth august seventeen letter the forty ninth cecile volange to the chevalier danceny without being false or frivolous monsieur it is enough for me to be enlightened as to my conduct to feel the necessity of altering it i have promised this sacrifice to god until such a time when i can offer him also that of my sentiments towards you which are rendered even more criminal by the religious character of your estate i feel certain that it will only bring me sorrow and i will not even hide from you that since the day before yesterday i have wept every time i have thought of you but i hope that god will do me the grace of giving me the needful strength to forget you as i ask of him morning and evening i expect also of your friendship and of your honour that you will not seek to shake me in the good resolution which has been inspired in me and in which i strive to maintain myself in consequence i beg you to have the kindness to write no more to me the more so as i warn you that i should no longer reply to you and that you would compel me to acquaint mamma with all that has passed and that would deprive me entirely of the pleasure of seeing you i shall none the less retain for you all the attachment which one may have without there being harm in it and it is indeed with all my soul that i wish you every kind of happiness i quite feel that you will no longer love me as much as you did and that perhaps you will soon love another better than me but that will be one penance the more for the fault which i have committed in giving you my heart which i ought to give only to god and my husband when i have one i hope that the divine mercy will take pity on my weakness and that it will give me no more sorrow than i am able to support adieu monsieur i can truly assure you that if i were permitted to love anybody i should never love anybody but you but that is all i may say to you and perhaps even that is more than i ought to say paris thirty first of august seventeen letter the fiftieth the president de tourvel to the vicomte de valmont is it thus then monsieur that you carry out the conditions upon which i consented sometimes to receive your letters and have i no reason for complaint when you speak to me of a sentiment to which i should still fear to abandon myself even if i could do so without violating all my duties for the rest if I had need of fresh reasons to preserve this salutary dread, it seems to me that I could find them in your last letter. In effect, at the very moment when you think to make an apology for love, what else are you doing but revealing to me its redoubtable storms? Who can wish for happiness bought at the expense of reason, whose short-lived pleasures are followed at any rate by regret, if not by remorse? You yourself, in whom the habit of this dangerous delirium ought to diminish its effect, are you not, however, compelled to confess that it often becomes stronger than yourself? And are you not the first to lament the involuntary trouble which it causes you? What fearful ravages, then, would it not effect on a fresh and sensitive heart, which would still augment its empire by the sacrifices it would be forced to make to it? You believe, monsieur, or you feign to believe, that love leads to happiness. And I— I am so convinced that it would render me unhappy that I would not even hear its name pronounced. It seems to me that only to speak of it destroys tranquillity, and it is as much from inclination as from duty that I beg you to be good enough to keep silence on this subject. After all, this request should be very easy for you to grant me at present. Returned to Paris, you will find there occasions enough to forget a sentiment which perhaps only owed its birth to the habit you are in of occupying yourself with such subjects, and its strength to the idleness of country life. Are you not then in that town where you had seen me with so much indifference? 
Can you take a step there without encountering an example of your readiness to change? And are you not surrounded there by women who, all more amiable than myself, have better right to your homage? I am without the vanity with which my sex is reproached. I have still less of that false modesty which is nothing but a refinement of pride. And it is with the utmost good faith that I tell you here, I know how few pleasing qualities I possess. Had I all there were, I should not believe them sufficient to retain you. To ask you, then, to occupy yourself no longer with me, is only to beg you to do to-day what you had already done before, and what you would most assuredly do again in a short time, even if I were to ask the contrary. This truth, which I do not lose sight of, would be itself a reason strong enough to disincline me to listen to you. I have still a thousand others, but without entering upon a long discussion, I confine myself to begging you, as I have done before, to correspond with me no further upon a sentiment to which I must not listen, and to which I ought even less to reply. At the Chateau de blank. First September, seventeen, blank. End of